In the unforgiving crucible of Compton streets, where innocence is a rarity and survival a daily battle, a 12-year-old gang member boldly predicts his future. Little did Chucky know that his life, intertwined with the Tortilla Flats gang, would become a haunting tale of choices, violence, and the relentless cycle that shapes destinies. As the sun dipped below the horizon, innocence clashed with survival, weaving a gripping narrative of loyalty, violence, and an unyielding bond with the Tortilla Flats gang. This is the story of a 12-year-old whose destiny was etched into the graffiti-covered walls of Compton's concrete jungle. The beginning of the prophecy, 1993. In the tumultuous abyss of 1993, an ominous prophecy began to take shape, casting its dark shadow over Southern California's heartless concrete jungle. It was a year when innocence was mercilessly crushed underfoot by the harsh, unforgiving realities of survival, a year that would mercilessly warp the fates of two young souls, Chucky and Midget. As the fiery sun descended beneath the bleak horizon, plunging Compton, a neighborhood fraught with turmoil and peril, into an abyss of darkness, the young Chucky and Midget were on the brink of a journey that defied the darkest imaginings of most 12-year-olds. Their tales, though still in their nascent stages, were already marred by the cruel and irrevocable marks of a sinister destiny. Amidst the eerie shadows of palm trees and sun-bleached streets, their lives were intertwined with the ominous fate of Tortilla Flats, a menacing street gang that held a tyrannical grip over Mulberry Street. This was a world where youth was a liability, where even the eldest members had barely surpassed their early twenties. Yet within this crucible of adversity, the youngest initiates, Chucky and Midget, were carving treacherous paths toward futures that defied all conventions. Police raids had become a grim routine at their gatherings. This intensified after several weeks had passed since the shocking assassination of two Compton police officers, a mere half mile from their location. The law enforcement officers scoured the vicinity, even the garage area where some gang members resided. Every gang member, regardless of their age, was subjected to pat-downs, forced to kneel in submission. From a young age, they had been indoctrinated to view the police as their relentless adversaries. Tattoos etched into their tender flesh were not mere ink. They were grim symbols of unwavering loyalty, marking their souls with a blood pact to tortilla flats that ran deeper than family ties. The gang had become their twisted family, and the brutal streets, their malevolent home. Within the confines of their graffiti-smeared clubhouse, a place that dared outsiders to enter, Chucky and Midget sought refuge. It was both a sanctuary, a symbol of audacious defiance, and a sinister gathering ground where they would kick it, as they ominously put it. From its desolate rooftop, they would peer out at the sprawling, sun-bleached expanse of Compton, oblivious to the sinister trajectories their lives were already tracing. As the youngest acolytes, Chucky and Midget had seamlessly assimilated into this unholy family, a family where innocence had been cruelly abandoned and the brutal ordeal of existence were ruthlessly inscribed onto their very beings. In a world where survival was tantamount to choosing one's allegiances, they had willingly embraced the malevolence of Tortilla Flats, a choice that would inexorably mold their destinies, for better or for unimaginably worse. But unbeknownst to them, the seeds of a dreadful prophecy had already been sown deep within their souls. The year 1993 heralded the inception of a chilling narrative that would bear the unyielding underbelly of Compton's streets, the relentless tango with fate that ensnared a 12-year-old gang member named Chucky, and the parallel odyssey of another young soul, Midget, whose destiny was tragically intertwined with Chucky's in a grotesque dance of malevolence. Midget, at his tender age, bore a name that belied not only his stature but also the tempestuous courage that raged within his heart. His allegiance to Tortilla Flats was unwavering, evident in the the macabre tattoos that adorned his skin, akin to battle scars of a damned soul. The weight of his loyalty served as a chilling testimony to the sinister bond he had forged within the gang. He was not able to go anywhere. He had a court-ordered ankle bracelet that beeps if he walks more than 50 feet from his home. This was a house arrest because he got caught with a gun and some stolen vehicles, but the rest of the gang was free. After a while, he sought off the ankle bracelet, suggesting that he couldn't go anywhere and couldn't make any money. Well, I couldn't go nowhere. Couldn't make no money doing nothing. It was boring. His 13-year-old brother, Little Woody, and 14-year-old brother, Lalo, were all in the gang, and all of them had been shot at least once. Their mother was frustrated by her sons. She wished they wouldn't be involved in this, fearing they would either die or end up in prison for the rest of their lives. I wish they wouldn't be involved in this. They're gonna die or they're gonna end up in prison for the rest of their life. And it's just like they're out of control. It's just like there's nothing I can do or say that'll make them do what they're supposed to do. It felt as though they were spiraling out of control. Every day, like clockwork, 
the relentless presence of the police prowled past Midget's residence. The law enforcement officers were intimately familiar with the gang's roster, identifying its members not by given names, but by their chilling nicknames. The clubhouse, a haven for Chucky, Midget, and their sinister brethren, was a graffiti-slathered shrine to their defiance and tenacity. It was not merely a location, it was an abomination that encapsulated their existence, a bastion of malevolent camaraderie amidst the maelstrom of Compton's heartless streets. Chucky and Midget were entrusted with spray cans, granting them a ghastly glimpse into a life that defiled the sanctity of childhood innocence. As they wielded those cans, they were not merely crafting graffiti, they were etching their own chilling sagas into the very walls of their damnation. Little did they fathom that these cursed markings would become their legacy, forever etching the trajectory of their malevolent destinies. Within this sinister garage that doubled as their cursed refuge, Chucky, Midget and their damned comrades slept, ate, and reveled in the sinister brotherhood of the gang. Education was but a distant spectre, and dreams of a brighter tomorrow had long been snuffed out. Instead, their existence was defined by the harrowing daily skirmishes for survival, a merciless battle waged on the unforgiving, blood-soaked streets of Compton. Chucky, a mere ten years of age, had already solidified his position within the gang, a testament to his unyielding tenacity and unwavering loyalty. For six interminable weeks, he had been ensnared in this inescapable web, a span that had transmogrified him from an innocent child into a nascent disciple of Tortilla Flats. The ten-year-old Chucky had been tainted by the malevolence of the streets, an innocence forever forsaken in the face of unrelenting darkness. He had even taken up the sinister habit of smoking, as though absorbing the bleakness of his environment with every puff. Midget, on the other hand, remained a steadfast companion to Chucky, an agonized witness to the torment that Midget himself had endured. The specter of Midget's torment loomed large, a ceaseless reminder of the abominations lurking in these relentless, Streets. Nevertheless, he stood resolute, determined to navigate a world that seemed inconceivably beyond his tender years. In this unyielding abyss, where loyalty was etched in the vilest of inks, vengeance fueled their motives, and innocence tiptoed perilously on the precipice of cruel reality, Chucky and Midget stood as perpetual acolytes in a macabre school of life that offered no guarantees. Their stories were inexorably woven into the graffiti-encrusted tapestry of Compton's Cursed Avenues, a tapestry that bore witness to the shattered hopes, grotesque dreams, and harrowing tragedies of a community ensnared by the unrelenting waltz of malevolent destiny. So, I suppose we've graduated from the school of the dead, Midget declared, his chilling words reverberating through the dimly lit garage. Indeed, it's a school where Chucky and Midget remain perpetual students, and at the tender ages of ten and twelve, when their peers frolic on bicycles and revel in sport, one can only wonder how Chucky and Midget found themselves enrolled in this accursed academy of malevolence. The grotesque juxtaposition of their lives against the backdrop of innocent childhood was stark and utterly disconcerting. While their peers reveled in the simplicity of youth, Chucky and Midget were entrenched in a world of malevolence, unwavering loyalty, and a twisted moral code that obliterated all semblance of decency. The young souls, defiant in the face of their own damnation, declared with an eerie indifference they don't truly care because they know that either the prison bars or death's cold embrace await them. They had already danced with the Grim Reaper's bullets, a total of seven to be precise for Midget. He said God had granted him two chances, and a third will only lead to his cold, lifeless demise. Me, I don't really care because I know I'm either going to end up in jail, I'm going to be dead. I already got shot a lot of times. God gave me two chances already. Third time, I'm going to die already. The prophecy that began its inexorable crawl in the year 1993 had set its unholy course, and the lives of these two young souls, Chucky and Midget, were irrevocably shackled to its malevolent decree. Little did they fathom that the years ahead would be riddled with anguish, torment, and a gruesome destiny that would etch an indelible scar on the malevolent streets of Compton. Chucky's origin. Chucky's early life was a sanctuary of love and warmth, where the embrace of his parents formed the cornerstone of his existence. For seven years, they provided a stable haven, a cocoon of safety that nurtured his youthful spirit. However, the darkness crept in with their separation, and what followed was a chilling descent into the abyss for young Chucky. The ominous shadows began to gather during Chucky's time at a Southgate school, where the world should have been filled with the joy of forming friendships and the precious gift of education. 
information. Behind closed doors, school administrators whispered of behavioral disturbances that cast an eerie foreshadowing of the turbulent path he would soon tread. Accusations of violence against another child sent chilling ripples through the school, early omens of the challenges that lay ahead. And then, one fateful day, the wheels of Chucky's life took an unforeseen turn. He embarked on a journey along the disused railroad tracks, a path that symbolized his departure from the familiar warmth of home and the reassuring presence of family. This journey, though seemingly innocuous, was the prelude to his ominous arrival in the treacherous domain of Compton and the relentless clutches of Tortilla Flats. Chucky's inexplicable disappearance left his mother, Norma Garcia, bewildered and enveloped in a profound sense of confusion. He just left because he wanted to. I mean, nobody told him to go or nothing. I wasn't mad at him. It would be five agonizing days before she could summon the strength to file a missing person report with the Southgate police. Her pain and uncertainty were almost tangible as she yearned for the return of her son, whose innocence once radiated like a beacon of hope. Chucky's vanishing act was a stark contradiction to the world he would come to know within the grim confines of Tortilla Flats. Here, he found an intoxicating sense of belonging that proved nearly impossible to resist. The gang members became his surrogate family, offering him protection and acceptance in a world where innocence had been supplanted by imminent danger. Desperate attempts by his family members to locate him within the flats often ended in futility, as Compton's unforgiving streets revealed little of his whereabouts. It was Chucky's aunt, Angela, who would serendipitously stumble upon him during her quest to rescue her wayward nephew. Their reunion marked a moment momentary turning point in Chucky's tumultuous odyssey. Angela's recognition of her nephew amidst the chaotic streets spurred her unwavering determination to liberate him from the clutches of Tortilla Flats. Her concern was palpable as she probed for details about his well-being, eating habits and possible vices. Gang members circled them, exerting their menacing influence to persuade Chucky to follow his aunt, albeit reluctantly. Yet, Chucky's bond with the streets remained resilient, a pledge he made with chilling resolve. In his confession to Angela, he made it clear that leaving the streets was not a consideration for him. The streets' inexorable pull kept Chucky within their malevolent grasp, despite the well-intentioned efforts to divert him from the impending doom that loomed. His familial ties and his newfound allegiance to Tortilla Flats clashed in a chilling tug of war, one that seemed destined to drag him deeper into the abyss. In a heart-wrenching televised plea, Chucky's mother Norma bared her soul to her estranged son. Her voice quivered with anguish as she professed her boundless love and yearning for his return. I love you and I want you to come home. Her desperation was underscored by the chilling testimonies of gang members, such as Crook, who openly declared their happiness at having Chucky within their ranks. Now I'm glad to have him around, you know? The big one was had me when I was little. And this is the only place that he sees love, you know what I mean? This is the only place that he sees people watching out for him and you know taking care of him and uh you know, giving him stuff and pay attention to him. For Chucky, the flats had become the only place where he experienced a semblance of family, a place where people seemed to genuinely care for him and watch over his well-being. They probably have my whole friends looking for me. Probably. Probably. They won't find me. You avoid him, huh? Huh? Yeah. I'll run. Another aunt, residing in Texas alongside Chucky's grandparents, sent a heartfelt letter to her wayward nephew. Her words were drenched in affection and concern, an earnest plea for him to forsake the malevolence of the streets and seek refuge with his family. She conveyed the unwavering love they held for him, along with their fervent desire to welcome him into their embrace. In response through a telephone call, Chucky tentatively agreed to make arrangements for his granddad to retrieve him, a flicker of hope amid the darkness. However, the streets, with their insidious allure, would pull him back before he could escape their clutches. Midget, a fellow gang member, bore the weight of his own haunting revelations about the perils of life within Tortilla Flats. He confided in Chucky, sharing tales of relentless fear and perpetual vigilance that defined their daily existence. The omnipresent danger that lurked around every corner was an ever-present spectre, one that haunted these young souls with unrelenting dread. Midget's scars, both physical and emotional, were chilling reminders of the ceaseless violence and danger that dominated their lives. Yet, even as Midget laid bare the horrors that festered within Tortilla Flats, Chucky's unwavering resolve compelled him back into the treacherous embrace of the gang. Alongside Midget and other gang members, he stood amidst the concealed graveyard of stolen cars, stripped of their valuable components, a haunting testament to the criminal underworld that had ensnared their lives. Midget's scars, 
each one a chilling narrative etched into his flesh, bore witness to a life perpetually entwined with violence and peril. His ability to recount his multiple gunshot wounds with an unsettling matter-of-factness underscored the grim reality of their existence. Bullets had punctuated their lives, leaving them with indelible marks that transcended the physical realm, numbing them to the pain and fear that most would find unbearable. In their world, this was a starkly routine ordeal. Despite Midget's harrowing scars and the omnipresent danger that loomed, Chucky's unwavering resolve clung fiercely to the streets. The secret of his true family remained well guarded, as his journey had led him to a world that defied societal norms and familial bonds. Here, amidst these brutal streets, blood ties had been overshadowed by an unwavering allegiance to the gang. Chucky's story highlights the harsh realities faced by many young individuals. They found themselves in an environment where innocence should prevail, but were instead trapped in a cycle of theft, danger, and a strong sense of belonging to a sinister world. 2003. In the year 1993, Fox 11 News embarked on a covert mission to uncover the stark realities of life for two young gang members in Compton. A decade later, the lingering question that haunted the collective consciousness was the fate that had befallen these individuals. The unsettling truth was that these boys had once painted a grim tableau of their future, one ominously veering toward an existence behind prison bars or meeting a violent demise on the merciless streets. As we fast forward to 2003, we find that the lives of Chucky, Midget, and their entanglement with the Tortilla Flats gang had indeed manifested as self-fulfilling prophecies. Compton, the backdrop against which this chilling narrative unfolds, is a place where firearms have tragically become as commonplace as the daily sunrise. In the unforgiving shadows of this city, the Tortilla Flats gang had established a menacing stronghold. The streets bore witness to an unsettling frequency of violence, with the gang etching its name in the annals of bloodshed. Midget, whose birth name is Danny Vadusco, had not only embraced, but embodied the gang's ruthless lifestyle. His body served as a canvas upon which the symbols of the Tortilla Flats were permanently etched, a testament to his unwavering loyalty. His intentions were glaringly evident to extract revenge upon his adversaries. Go kill my enemies, the one that shot me. If you don't even know who it was, though, do you? I can find out. The scars on his body bore witness to his determination, as two gunshot wounds had left an ugly, sprawling reminder from chest to lower stomach. The first encounter with gunfire Fire had forced doctors to surgically remove a kidney, and the second had ruthlessly claimed his spleen. Meanwhile, Chucky, a mere ten-year-old at the time, found himself ensnared within the same garage where they sought shelter, surrounded by the ominous presence of handguns and an air thick with the stench of violence. Midget's chilling resolve to eliminate his enemies was disturbingly palpable. Notably, Midget's 13-year-old brother, Woody, was also inextricably intertwined with the gang's dark grasp. They won't snitch, man. They just keep blasting back at you and you blast at them. That's just fun. We having shootouts. If my brother dies, I'll, if somebody kills him, I'll have, to, I'll have to back him up. I'll keep doing those fools up over and over until I kill one of them. That's how it is. Most alarmingly, they had welcomed into their fold the newest recruit, a 10-year-old known as Little Chucky. Midget's life took him through the grim corridors of juvenile detention centers and the California Youth Authority for the better part of the subsequent six years. The absence of a father figure and his mother's struggle to rein in her sons painted a bleak picture. She lamented her powerlessness to steer them away from a path that seemed inexorably bound for either an untimely demise or a lifetime of incarceration. At the tender age of 14, Midget's path had irrevocably veered into the realm of self-destruction an ominous trajectory catalogued within court records. As the weight of his choices bore down upon him, he found himself prescribed psychotropic medication, a desperate attempt to tether his rapidly fraying existence. However, a faint glimmer of hope seemed to pierce through the darkness during his tenure at CYA's Nellis School in Whittier. Here, he embarked on a journey of redemption, enrolling in an anti-gang program that led him down an unexpected path. Against all odds, he earned his high school diploma, a beacon of aspiration amidst a sea of despair. It was as if he sought someone, anyone, who could offer a glimmer of care and positivity in his tumultuous life, someone. Beyond the clutches of the older homies who had ensnared him in their web of violence and retribution. I think he was looking for someone to care about, about him, someone positive to have in his life um, other than the older homies. Following his release from the Youth Authority, Officer Zembel intervened in an audacious attempt to sever the indelible ties that had left Midget marked by his gang affiliations. At the age of 19, Midget ventured to a prestigious Beverly Hills plastic surgeon's office, where the tattoos that had etched his loyalty were to be painstakingly removed. It was a bold endeavor to escape the shackles of his past, a gesture that hinted at the possibility of a life unburdened by the haunting symbols of his former life. 
Yet, as the days elapsed, a chilling call to action summoned Midget back into the cold, unforgiving clutches of the Tortilla Flats gang. The darkness that had threatened to consume him resurfaced with a vengeance. In a horrifying turn of events, he plunged a blade into the vulnerable flesh of a 16-year-old and an 18-year-old at a graduation party, concealed behind the facade of a nondescript Long Beach storefront. A sinister applause seemed to echo through the night, as both victims, against all odds, clung to the fragile thread of life. Yet, the relentless cycle of violence and tragedy showed no mercy. Just three short months later, the Tortilla Flats gang assembled once more, but this time, it was to mourn the loss of a 19-year-old soul. Imelda de la Cruz, fueled by alcohol and embroiled in a confrontation at a Compton party, had unwittingly sealed her fate. A dispute with a rival gang member spiraled into a chaotic melee, culminating in a deadly symphony of gunfire. Imelda was struck by an onslaught of bullets, her life extinguished in a horrifying crescendo of violence, leaving yet another void in the mournful tapestry of the Tortilla Flats' grim legacy. She pulled out a gun, several other people pulled out guns, and uh, it kind of a shooting, uh, a helter-skelter shooting occurred. Midget's older brother, Woody, had recently experienced a tumultuous breakup with Imelda de la Cruz, a woman who had met a tragic end in the Compton shootout. Soon after Imelda's demise, Woody appeared late to her funeral, ostensibly consumed by grief. However, prosecutors would later argue that he had perpetrated another murder shortly before attending the service. The victim, Johnny Rios, known as Big Chucky, met a grim fate that day. He had been involved in the same shootout that claimed Imelda's life, and prosecutors contended that his death was no mere accident. Johnny had been a lifelong friend of Midget and Woody, and he readily offered Midget a ride to Imelda's funeral. However, upon arriving at a nondescript Linwood residence, their nefarious intent became shockingly evident. Johnny was ensnared in a deadly ambush, with six of the ten 9mm bullets discharged by Woody proving fatal. Midget advanced upon Johnny, delivering two chilling 40 caliber slugs directly into Johnny's head at point-blank range. When law enforcement arrived at the scene, they found Johnny lifeless in his still-running vehicle, his chances of survival utterly extinguished. It was a brutal act of vengeance, unfolding on the very same day as Imelda's funeral. The aftermath was swift and unrelenting for Midget and Woody. Both brothers found themselves incarcerated, tried, convicted of first-degree murder, and subsequently sentenced to life imprisonment without the faintest glimmer of parole on the horizon. Their transformation from impressionable youth to ruthless killers was undeniable. Midget, during his time behind bars, became increasingly associated with the Mexican Mafia. He functioned as a messenger, distributed illicit substances, and even assumed the role of a Mafia enforcer, ruthlessly targeting individuals that the Mafia sought to eliminate. In a chilling turn of events, in January of the previous year, Midget received an additional 10-year sentence for stabbings he had committed in Long Beach a harrowing two and a half years earlier. His actions demonstrated a blatant disregard for authority and an unsettling propensity for violence. Enraged with his court-appointed defense attorney, Midget resorted to an audacious act of defiance. Concealed beneath his eyelid, he harbored a razor, a weapon born of desperation, symbolizing his complete indifference to the repercussions. Before a judge and jury, he initiated a shocking act of violence by slashing his 64-year-old lawyer across the face. It was a visceral display of utter disregard for the legal system, an unequivocal testament to the darkness that had enveloped his soul. As the final sentencing report was compiled for Midget, it left no room for ambiguity or redemption. Its stark conclusion resounded clearly. Midget should never, under any circumstances, be allowed to reintegrate into free society. The chilling epithet of very cold-blooded followed him as he embarked upon a life sentence, incarcerated within the unforgiving confines of a maximum security prison located in Corcoran. A mere 23 years old, his fate had been sealed, a life devoid of even the remotest possibility of parole, an existence forever ensnared by the inexorable choices that had propelled him along this nightmarish trajectory. Burn bright, burn fast. In the dark underbelly of a world cloaked in shadows and treachery, little Chucky emerged as the youngest and most fragile piece on a sinister chessboard, a seemingly innocent face concealed beneath the guise of a cholo draped in a t-shirt and a gleaming gold chain. Chucky was the embodiment of youth drawn into the wicked fold of the Tortilla Flats gang. But his tender age was a stark contrast to the grizzled, battle-hardened gangsters who surrounded him, a macabre dance with destiny pushing him ever closer to a future shrouded in uncertainty and foreboding. The story of Angel Chucky signs unfolds as a gripping and heart-wrenching account of a boy who, with chilling prescience, foresaw a grim fate of prison bars or an early grave. Over the course of a decade, he transitioned from a troubled child into a fully-fledged member of the notorious 
notorious Tortilla Flats gang, a metamorphosis fueled by a litany of harrowing experiences. Angel Signs, once a boy of ethereal innocence, marked only by a fiery temper, was destined for a tumultuous childhood. Abandoned by his father at the tender age of six, his life took a nightmarish turn as he fell victim to a brutal assault by a middle-aged neighbor, an event that left indelible scars. He was supposed to be his friend. He would give him toys and stuff like that, and all of a sudden, look what he did to him. You know what I mean? And you raped him, actually. He did. Yeah. Raised by a struggling single mother, Angel yearned for support and guidance that seemed eternally out of reach. In the words of lifelong friend Ricky Contreras, nobody cared about him. He didn't feel loved. Nobody cared about him. He didn't feel loved, you know. That's one thing he always should talk about. Angel's mother, too, remembers the cruel betrayal by a man who should have been a protector, a betrayal that cast a long shadow over her son's life. Angel signs, now the enigmatic Chucky, found himself in Compton, a breeding ground for the gang lifestyle he would soon embrace. The Tortilla Flats gang, infamous for its criminal exploits, became his new family. Within their ranks, a figure named Rafael Gamboa, aka Crook, took the young Chucky under his wing, initiating him into the perilous world of street life. Crook, reflecting on their bond, grimly stated, that's all street love, that's all I got to give him, I don't got nothing else to give him. In return, Chucky absorbed the ruthless realities of the streets, mastering criminal activities ranging from battery and robbery robbery to burglary and car theft. Chucky's life soon spiraled into a relentless cycle of incarceration. Juvenile Hall and California Youth Authority jails became his second home. By the age of 19, he was saddled with fatherhood, a girlfriend, unemployment, and an ever-weakening desire to tread a legitimate path. While living with his mother provided a semblance of stability, the streets continued to exert an irresistible pull. Unexpectedly, Chucky's journey took a fateful twist when his fellow Tortilla Flats gang members relocated to Oklahoma City, a city where the drug trade thrived, especially in methamphetamine. In this new environment, Chucky's comrades, including Dennis Gonzalez, known as Little Boxer, were deeply entrenched in the criminal underworld. In a shocking and horrifying turn of events, a double homicide shook Oklahoma City to its core. Among the victims was Alicia Chavira, a drug dealer with ties to the Southside Locos gang. Chucky, now living in the Antelope Valley, found himself entangled in this gruesome crime. The tragedy unfolded when Chucky, accompanied by another gang member called Clumsy, was alleged allegedly dispatched on a deadly mission to eliminate Alicia Chavira. The motive behind the murder was rumored to be a drug debt dispute, escalating tensions, and a chilling lack of loyalty within the Tortilla Flats gang. The consequences were catastrophic. Alicia Chavira lay lifeless, a victim of gun violence, and Chucky met a similarly gruesome fate. Reports even suggested that a witness had seen Chucky being shot by his own comrade, shattering the illusion of loyalty within the gang and casting a chilling light on the darkness that enveloped their world. As Chucky's mother grapples with the anguish of losing her son, she is left with haunting questions about the senseless violence that plagues gangs like the Tortilla Flats. The very idea of a gang, purportedly a surrogate family, turning on its own members remains a poignant and painful paradox, a testament to the depths of depravity to which their world descends. Amid ongoing investigations into the Oklahoma City murders, mysteries surrounding the role of drug kingpin Little Boxer and the involvement of others like Lisa Gonzalez remain unanswered. The streets bear witness to a convoluted tapestry of intrigue and betrayal a world where loyalties are as fragile as glass. The life and death of Angel Chucky signs serve as a harrowing reminder of the relentless grip of street life and the seductive allure of gang culture, what began as a troubled childhood, spiraled into a decade-long descent into criminality, incarceration, and ultimately, a tragically inevitable demise. Chucky's life, like a dark and twisted Shakespearean tragedy, was marked by a relentless march toward a shocking and heart-rending conclusion, a chilling testament to the unforgiving nature of the shadows in which he walked. This is the tale of a 12-year-old whose future was etched against the graffiti-clad backdrop of Compton's urban terrain. If you found this video compelling, please feel free to select the card on your screen to uncover more videos of a similar nature.